just to introduce myself, my name's Ian, I think I've met a few of you before. I've been in and around Gloucestershire for about the last 10 or 11 years or so. Um, I was brought here with the work at the Royal Agricultural University, so I've been teaching there, primarily sort of countryside environment, my background's in soil science. Um, but yes, got involved with butterfly conservation. Um, won't come as a surprise to many of you, but Sue Smith's uh, Magical Powers of Persuasion got me involved. And, um, and in particular with the site at um, Miserden, um, typically called Bull Banks, which is, I don't know if you can see my arrow. This is the Bull Banks site here, but the site that butterfly conservation has been involved with for a good time before I even arrived was around this section here. It's, it's along the River Froome. It um, follows one of the sort of um, Stroud Five Valleys. It feeds into, into Stroud there. There's a Miserden estate, there's the house up here, and it's quite a nice valley, quite marginal areas. And as a consequence of that, I think that's maintained some of the qualities of some of the grasslands. So I'll be talking about this section here and this section here today. And thanks also, before I forget to, to do so, to Dave Perkins, who's um, in effect my mentor on this site. He was uh, doing much of the management prior to me coming in here and Ken Savenka and Mark Taylor for transect work that they've done and um, not least others, um, Peter Hugo has really been supportive with the, the moth trapping in particular and Karen and Phil Colborn for um, the graziers with the cattle uh, working on this site. So again it's giving you a little bit of an inkling into it's not just uh, down to one institute or the individuals etc it is a bit more of a partnership and not least the estate for letting us the Misden estate for letting us do all our stuff here um, so as a reflection here um, we've got um, lots of different inputs from different individuals different people projects back from the brink Jen and Julian um, we've got the estate owners the farmers not least the Cotswold Voluntary Wardens uh, had a fantastic input to this and the community watching the cattle etc etc um, but each of these for want of a better term I'm using stakeholders um, have got their own sort of they want their particular interest area their particular outcomes um, much of the time there's common outcomes and um, they can be achieved by coordinating and bringing people together, groups together, to um, deliver, start to deliver these outcomes. But I was sort of um, wondering about this site. It's been a great opportunity as a, if you like, a, a teaching platform. So our students at the REU, our conservation students in particular, um, we do place emphasis on getting them out in the field and doing practical activities, much as uh, the sort of volunteer days have been mentioned already but to give them a hands-on, literally a hands-on experience. And that's, that includes the practical, that means, you know, coppicing or clearing trees or grassland restoration, etc. cetera. Um, but it also hopefully gives them a, a feel for who's working there, often working alongside these groups and learning from them. And so looking at the process of what goes into this. So trying to tie, tie a few, put a few links between each of these groups and trying to determine um, more um, effective ways of getting together, uh, identifying projects, what the objectives might be, and then actually stepping back and seeing whether those outcomes have actually been delivered. So I was trying to place a little bit more emphasis on, well, is this management input that's going on, is it actually working? Um, so it's good to do a day's work of activity, you might walk away, I know butterfly conservation do go back and monitor they're really good at, good at that um, but sometimes it's it, it might be useful to actually um, have, have the reassurance that some of these projects are working um, and when I say projects it could be just type small little questions um, we had one um, a few years ago when um, I initially kicked off with picking up on this site um, uh, Dave Perkins had organised the Cotswold Voluntary Wardens to come on an annual basis to cut back the back bracken and control the bracken um, because if it gets if it's left to its own devices it ends up something like this figure here 
I'm hoping everybody can see the, um, the arrow here. Um, it ends up like a forest of thick bracken, which um, just um, outcompetes any of the understory vegetation and, and hence reduces uh, biodiversity potential. It's a native species, it's, um, it's, but it's acting like an invasive. Um, but yeah, the, the volunteers have been coming along for, I think, the previous 10 years prior to 2011. And they'd come and they cut the bracken and then they'd be invited back the next year to cut the bracken and and, and so forth. Um, and yeah, one of their questions was, well, we keep coming back every year um, and we're cutting back the bracken. It doesn't seem to be working. Is it working? Do you think it's working? Um, so it wasn't too difficult to start asking the question, um, perfectly sensible question, and to try and investigate that. And I've put a few examples of what what subsequently went on here, um, specifically with our opportunities in academia and using this as a, a teaching tool for students, um, it sort of lent itself to a field experiment. So in that patch you've just seen there, we just basically split it up into five meter by five meter replicate plots. Um, so there's three replicates of three treatments um and comparing against the control so this is the what would happen if none of the cutting went on any of the years um and then looking at the three treatments here so typically this is what the would happen um each year so the volunteers have come in and cut it once a year uh it's linking in with the evidence so again dipping into what potential advantages we have in the academic world we've looked at all the research elsewhere and um, work has been done quite quite a bit of work has been done on bracken control and cutting more often um, is a way and means of uh, controlling it and um, so that was one of the treatments and then subsequently some work locally had shown that if you pulled uh, bracken uh, that also was quite effective at controlling it which all makes sense really. If you cut it back frequently, you're knocking its resources back, it's got to put more energy into regrowth. If you pull in the part, partially some of the roots out, again, you feel like you're taking some of that carbohydrate resource and uh, again, you'll be weakening the plants. Um, so th this was sort of logic behind it. And again, it links in um, with Okay, we could have take, taken one of the pres prescribed methods that are used in the Derbyshire Peak District and used perhaps Azulam or cut more frequent, frequently with machinery, etc. Um, but that didn't really lend itself to small conservation sites like that. And also with yeah, the volunteers and the volunteer activities and then getting together, doing this work, um, there's that social ex ex experience as well and the exposure to green space, the health and well-being, all that sort of stuff. Um, it'd be difficult to justify for such a small space uh, a cutting machine for this, this area as well. So there's those other things that are taken into consideration. So in answer to the Cotswold volunteer um, uh, question about is our cutting each year working? The answer was yes, um, in differing ways. The cutting once and cutting twice both worked as effectively as each other, which was a surprise. I thought cutting twice might have knocked it back further. This is based on measurements of the plant performance, heights and densities and things like that. Um, so the cutting once a year had as much effect as cutting twice. Um, so it, it exposed the understory vegetation, it gave that a bit of a chance, etc. The pulling, surprisingly, wasn't as good as the cutting, um, the cutting treatments. Um, and this was a surprise, possibly stimulating regrowth of um, uh, new fronds from the sort of carpet of rhizome, perhaps. I'd, uh, it's difficult to find explanations in some situations. But those, those were the core results. So the answer was yes, and what you're doing is good. Please come back every year subsequent. Um, you're doing a great job. Are these things working? Yes, great. Okay, we'll get that information out there and spread the word. So we've been doing that with, with uh, again, linking in with what academics are about, 
Uh, we want to uh, both develop our research careers as well, but we also want to relay this information. So using journals like Conservation Evidence, it's based on uh, like an interface between academia and practitioners. It's a quite easy, accessible journal. So we've used that as an example. And I think also there was some something in British wildlife, more accessible sort of um, journal that, 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 that links in with that as well. So going back to this slide again, um, we've got all these different groups, different people, different uh, agendas to certain extents. Um, well, all our common agendas as well. Trying to sort of step back from that and make some analysis of how these groups work together and can um, there be some sort of a framework or a coordination uh, to get the best out of all the, the sort of the, the people, the time, resources, finance, the costs, etc. Um, this this slide tried to capture some of that and it's using Mizzardon as a, a bit of a platform, a bit of a, a case study or example, but equally this could be applying to rough banks or other, other places, um, typically smaller conservation sites, but again the, 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 um, it's probably got some generic application in a wider sense as well. So I've got the, the, the columns at the top uh, which is just broadly tried to capture some of the partnership groups which are, are working um, on these sorts of projects. So we've got the RAU um, as an institute, an academic institute, along with the students and their activities, their teaching, but also their reach, research that they're doing, the dissertation works and, and the like. We've got the landowner, the estates, we've got Butterfly Conservation as one of the uh, NGOs and the Back from the Brink project. Community involvement, really inv important. Uh, Cotswold Voluntary Wardens, Grazier, uh, the cattle, key management tool in particular with the grassland restoration. Um, and species, the species and habitat, they're in effect, they're the objectives, but they're the stakeholders they've got, um, um, they're, they're being monitored. And the geos, the uh, natural, natural England is an example for this one. You can start to see where there's there's benefits and it's this mutualistic benefits. So in achieving the objectives that we're aiming for, the management objectives, there's benefits to be had. The students are going to get some practical experience. The estate owner's getting free, free labour. The estate owner's getting some practical land management done. Um, similarly, in natural England are having an input. Uh, there's the agri-environmental scheme giving some sort of financial injection there. There's graduate attributes, research has got this inquiry based learning. So I like to, you know, rather than just looking at a quite a sterile example on the PowerPoint slides of, for students to learn from, it's really good to get them out in the field and get them actually setting up an experiment like, like the Bracken one, for example. And they can form dissertations around that. The academic staff can have inputs, etc. But you can see the, the ideas that the grazier gets some free grazing, provide the conservation grazing, fantastic PR all round. Um, got to make most of that, get that sort of message out there. And then the volunteers and community permissive access, health and well-being aspects as well. So there's a whole raft of different sort of core benefits to be had from, from these sorts of projects, which shouldn't go unrecognized. And trying to sort of build on that, um, I know um, some of you, um, certainly Sue, was that um, we got a little bit of Monday, money for, um, from the AOMB, the Cotswold uh, Conservation Board, uh, the Sustainable Development Fund, um, just to try and build a little bit around these sort of platforms that we're talking about. We had a meeting before Christmas, about 20 representatives from different organizations mixed in with all our students and some of our academic staff. And we're trying to identify fairly simple uh, projects uh, with questions around management. Um, is management input, I mean, uh, is conservation grazing, for example, having an, an effect on floristic diversity of a limestone grassland? Um, is that being delivered? And, and around questions like that, we could start to form a framework, well, how can we get students involved with that? How can we get different partners, et cetera, in order to answer that question? 
there were three main, there's plenty of ideas, which was great, um, just shows where there's the demand for this sort of information. But there were three main themes that jumped out and that linked in with conservation grazing, grassland restoration, um, arable plants, again, probably uh, an area that's often um, ignored. It's seen an arable field, you don't often see it as a valuable habitat, but there are a lot of plant species that depend on that. Um, and another one was the impact of pheasants on habitat and species. So they're the so three key themes that seem to jump out. We're pursuing these, I mean, we've obviously, people have mentioned it already, um, got the challenges with um, COVID, um, but we are trying to find ways around that. Um, and then, yeah, these are some, we had the Brecken question earlier on. These are some other examples of questions that arose. Conservation grazing, I'll mention that in a moment. Um, this is the arable, just sort of following up with that last, last point. Um, yeah, this is linked in with uh, plant life and the red hemp nettle, this one here. Uh, that's been going nearly two years now. In this last few weeks, we were back at the site. This is an arable field up at Harn Hill and the red hemp nettle has made an appearance. We found about, I think there's about 10 plants um, that have been linked in. That's linked in with Q Millennium Seed Bank as well. They, um, whoops, they um, provided the seeds, I think about 27,000 seeds in all. Um, but, you know, that's, that's coming through. Um, I won't say too much about this because I know Chris is going to be talking about this soon with the bug planting of violets. There were some great outcomes from that, some evidence-based outcomes in terms of what treatments have the best effect at the um, plant establishment and flowering. Um, birds as well as butterflies, willow tit habitat, looking at logs. This was linked in with some work that done been done around the Wildlife Trust around Manchester, how fast logs decompose so that willow tits can drill their holes into the logs and uh, create the nest habitat. And also scrub management, scrub control, what different methods could be used. And linked in with, I mean, typically the ecosystem services are often linked in with biodiversity, but you can also look at the other services. In this case, it was carbon sequestration in scrub or hedgerows. Um, and this is a fairly recent work, but we've got some fantastic relationships between measuring the basal area of stems of scrub and relating that to the total carbon biomass so you can relate this formula here do some simple measures in the field and you can calculate how much is growing in the field um, and drilling down a little bit further into some other case studies uh, grasslands both grazed grassland and non-grazed grassland um, this is the one whoops sorry this is the one up at uh, Miserdam, uh, the round the corner from the Bull Bank site. And this is the other thing about these these little projects is they, they can be long term as well. So uh, well, this slide is now probably five or six years now since it's been grazed. But there's there's this it's split, split into four sections. You can see the, the, the treatments there. This is primarily aimed at trying to encourage cowslip and hence the Duke of Burgundy. It's a site where the Duke of Burgundy has been in the past, as far back as the late 1990s or thereabouts, um, and trying to create the habitat so that the species hopefully will come back. You can see what happens if the area isn't grazed, it gets quite clumpy, the grass is like a mulch area, mulch, mulch, in, mulch in between. Not a lot of floristic diversity, it's quite suppressive, you leave grasses to grow too long without cutting and removing. And this one is the early autumn, late winter. Difficult to see, but there is a bit more colour in there. Um, and the results are sort of reiterating that. But we're also looking at subtleties in terms of cowslip uh, plant sizes and structures and as well as densities. Um, last year, good news, there was a pair of um, Duke of Bern Burgundy that made a reappearance. Um, Nice surprise. Um, there might have been a question or two as to where, where they came from. There's quite a distance between populations, but that was great news. And then similarly, the working in partnership with the golf, golf course, Sciences to Golf Course, where no grazing is allowed, typically, yeah, you wouldn't imagine cattle on the golf course. 
Um, but yeah, cutting, raking, similar to the verge work mentioned earlier, uh, and then plug planting and how effective is the plug planting. So students involved, seeing how, what the evidence base is, how many of these plants actually um, survive and proliferate and hopefully seed and form little islands for the Duke of Burgundy. And there is a nice population there, albeit a small population. So we're trying to build on that. And then other things, uh, again, grassland related, a student did some work on the same plots at Miserdon and he was looking at mammals, found some interesting things. You wouldn't get mammals in a sward that's anything less than 12 centimetres in depth. And surprisingly, the um, managed, uh, the no grazed uh, grassland, which is this, this chunky stuff here, it had less um, uh, numbers, fewer numbers of mammals than the partially grazed sites. And we think that was probably due to regrowth and they still got the protection from predators, but it got also got the regrowth from the partial grazing. So some interesting things there and repercussions for orchards and damage to orchards and how, how to manage sward, to manage mammals. And this one, just a, a small bit of work. You've got the, um, the particular grasses that you don't want. Often the, the cattle will go elsewhere and go for the fresher stuff, but trying to encourage them to eat the older, ranker grasses um, technique used in Australia, Africa, etc. Spread molasses on the grass and that sweetens it up and that encourages these uh, cattle to graze it. So I did a little bit of work and that, that seemed to show some nice results as well. It did encourage them to eat these target species. Um, yeah, so as regards some of the outcomes, quite a variety of species at the site. Um, these are data and again, thanks go to Ken, Ken Savenka and Mark Taylor and David, David Perkins, who are the transect walkers and have been for many years, uh, building up a fantastic data set. It really does indicate um, the efficacy of uh, management inputs, but also over time. So I've tried here to capture the numbers, uh, the, the species present. As you can see, there's quite a diversity of species that have made an appearance at this site and also the time on this bar here. Um, it's, if you look at it in a, in a sort of broad sense, you can see that, yeah, certain species are doing better than others, as you'd imagine, the ringlet there, the meadow brown. But yeah, you can also see there's a general upward um, increase over time. Some of the species, uh, some have made appearances and disappeared and things like that. But, um, it's, I think it's uh, generally a, a sort of good news story in terms of the, the evidence from the, the, the species there. Um, not forgetting the, the dark side, um, moss, uh, and this is where Peter came in, uh, getting across some Dave Grundy as well, uh, helping with some student activities monitoring moths, um, target moths here in the plume prominence. But knowing about these species then raises the um idea of well how do we manage the habitat for them so keep the maple um when when doing a bit of clearance keep the maple trees for example it's um it's awesome and not forgetting uh some other species as well so linked in with the back from the brink uh reptile uh studies that have gone on um, with sheila sheila ely and uh, julian set up various different uh hibernacular uh, we have got adders on the site, so we, we do bear in mind those in the, in the management plans as well. Roman snails, glow worms. Um, I don't know if anybody's got any ideas what I'm trying to convey with this one. I did have a bit more of a graphic image of a, a dead deer, um, which I've sort of held back on. Um, we've got the quite big print, tail mark there, and this was adjacent to where the dead deer was. There'd been movement of that deer and hair. This is uh, part of another project we were involved with, is looking at big cats, big cats in Gloucestershire. Um, and there's interesting evidence as to presence absence. I know Peter, Peter Hugo's had experience at this site. Um, and there's some really sort of good, reliable uh, sightings that have come from these. So it's quite tentative. So we've been putting up camera traps and the like which um, 
yeah, it's, it adds to the, the mix and the interest and the different dimensions of a site like this. But I think key, key to all of this are the, the sort of frameworks and the people, and the inputs, uh, the time effort that people put into these sorts of things um, and how to get the best, um, get the best from all this sort of effort and hopefully deliver the sorts of outcomes that um, we all want, more butterfly, more species diversity. Um, so I think I've thanked people, um, there's a list there, there's, there's others as well, not least Cotswold Conservation Board with the Sustainable Development Fund. Um, I'm happy to take any questions, Jen. Great, thanks Ian. That's actually really interesting to show, to sort of show graphically the interactions between all the different stakeholders and then the benefits that each provide sort of across, across the board. So um, that, that type of thing you could imagine would be quite useful when, when you're going for sort of funding for, for projects and mm -hmm. the like. But um, yeah, you mentioned um, Bracken and you were looking at cutting or pulling. Mm. And I, as I say, Trisha's just asked the same, same thing. Um, did you look at bracken bashing at all? Or did yeah. I miss that? Yeah, well, I think this, this is probably where it comes to um, starting to build into the sort of decision making on what sort of management approach might take place. Um, now, bashing and bruising and things like that have been out there as, as, as a treatment um, for controlling bracken for, for some time. Um, I was really looking at some of the literature um, and one of the more recent papers was, was saying that um, it's not that effective. They did actually break it down, well, when I say break it down, they did examine what happened with a stem of bracken and they looked at it under a microscope and the like. And, and even though it looked really quite damaged uh, and broken, um, there was still the linkages between the root and the upper stem. So there's still the functionality of that plant in growing, performing for synthesizing and the like. Um, and similarly, larger and more extensive um, experiments on managing bracken. Um, have, I think it's a bit mixed, it's, there's different things, but I think the consensus is that the, the bruising um, isn't as effective as the other methods. Um, as tempting as it might be, you just roll it rather than cut it and things like that. I mean, with the cutting as well, um, we've yet to crunch the numbers and the like and find out how much nutrient base there is in, in, in bracken, but the wardens are typically, typically cutting and then raking and then creating the habitat piles and the like, but they're taking the nutrients away from the site. So it'd be, some, it'd be nice to get some sort of nutrient balance work done on that, that experiment as well. Um, so try to add value to what's already there. Yeah, yeah, because that's that's the method I've, well, not myself, but I know a place I used to work uses, and I'm just wondering whether I need to report this back to them. But that sort of made me think: Do you, you, you report your results in? I think you said journals and like British Wildlife, and um, so yeah. you, you do your 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 um, write ups and those. Do do you sort of? get straight directly to conservation organizations like wildlife trust and other yeah. <clears throat> did it go directly to them i'm just wondering yeah 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 i think that's a good question um i mean they there's i mean there's a temptation for academics to go high flying and many do in terms of the the high level journals and conferences and the like but essentially there you're talking to other academics and and your papers are being read by other academics um, which is fine, um, but this, I mean, the, the, the sort of core idea behind this, this project is, is trying to develop that interface between that academic input and the practitioners, what's going on on the ground. Um, because, I mean, it could be a fantastic paper, but if nobody reads it and then implements it, uh, then it's next to useless. Um, so trying to make those linkages, um, and there's there is scope to, I mean, talking at meetings like this one, um, meeting people on the ground, sort of workshops, working alongside volunteers, conveying this information um, as and when, when opportunities arise, articles for um, the more popular sort of magazines or um, um, reviews, et cetera, um, is, is the way forward as well, I think. 
I think it has to be, otherwise things don't won't necessarily get implemented. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was just it was just that was interesting about the bracken and and I feel like perhaps most people, certainly where I came from, probably are still perhaps bashing the bracken and perhaps it's not gonna do the job. Um so yeah. Um thank you very much, Ian. That was really interesting. Um if we get any more questions come in, I'll I'll put them to you. But um thank you very much. Yeah, thank, you. Good, thank you.